So now I think it's I think it's time to pivot into uh, some some more live read throughs. So reaction time. Yes, reaction, reaction time. time. So I again, haven't cheated, Joe. I have not cheated. Good. Uh, I I cheated just a teeny bit just to to see what we were to see what we were kind of getting into. Um, so we're gonna look at we're gonna look at two IPOs that are that are coming next week. Uh, Legal Zoom, uh, which will be symbol LZ, I believe is uh, scheduled to premiere on the New York Stock Exchange on Wednesday, June 30th. And Krispy Kreme, symbol there, D-Nut, D-N-U-T, is scheduled to premiere on July 1st. So, Todd, which one do you want to start with? Oh, I don't grab bag it, grab bag. Well, you know, I love Krispy Kreme donuts. So all right, let's do Krispy Kreme. <laughs> if you want to pull up the Krispy Kreme one, we'll give yeah. that a go. And what you know, that's good branding on their part, donut for the symbol. Yep. yep. Uh it's it's good. They they could have easily done uh D-O-N-T, which probably would not have been no. great branding. <laughs> so I'm I'm glad they went with D nut. I don't yeah, so here, uh, listeners, we're looking at their at their uh, S one filing right now, um, and so we'll, there's a lot of a lot of kind of fluff in here that we're not going to get into, uh, but basically we're we're looking at the the things that I'm interested in personally are their the financials over the past one to three years what the share price is going to be and how that looks for, for evaluation. So just a little background on the company here. Um, you know, most of you have probably had a Krispy Kreme donut in your life. They're delicious. Um, they've they been are around delicious. For many, many if you years. like Krispy Kreme donuts, smash the like below. <laughs> yes, absolutely. So yeah, here we, here we go. So uh, fiscal year 2020, they did 1.1 billion in net revenue. Uh, adjusted EBITDA of 152.8 million, uh, adjusted net income of 47.9 million, which ended up with a loss of 60.9 million. I'm not terribly surprised by that. A lot of companies had a tough 2020. I'm sure Krispy Kreme was no exception. Having to having to close storefronts, I imagine some of their stores probably completely shuttered for a, at least a brief time. And then obviously it would have been like drive through only after that for quite a while too. So uh, yeah, Todd, I think that's anything? Probably, Joe, that's probably looking at this chart here and listeners, I'll just explain what I'm looking at. If you're not on YouTube, I'll, you can also go to the YouTube and just go to YouTube and see these if you want to look at the charts after. But I think Joe, maybe that's one of the reasons, you know, in the S1, you're always kind of trying to put your best Best spin on it possible because you're trying to attract institutional investors to to own your shares. But you do have five year. They're showing the five year compounded annual growth rate of 19. percent So I think that's probably one of the reasons why um, you know they're they're showing that longer term view because you're right. You know, kind of hard to imagine. Although they probably they probably do sell. Joe, maybe we'll find that out. We, they probably do sell in a lot of you know, grocery, maybe in grocery stores and convenience stores, maybe you can get out, get them there too. You don't actually need to be one of the physical stores. I mean, they talk about global points of access, right? Joe, they say that right. there's 8,275 points of access up from 5,720 in 2016. So a point of access would be a place where you can buy a Krispy Kreme product. Is that correct? Yeah, it shows, let's see, it's uh, three. So we'll go down to note three, global points of access, uh, all locations where yep. you can buy donuts and cookies. So yeah, so the, there's a, a combination of other, other stores that aren't owned by Krispy Kreme and then their own, their company owned stores and they have franchises as well. Yeah. Um, so yeah, just gives you a general idea here. I just noticed this line and I have to point this out. The, they are part of, they consider themselves to be part of the $650 billion dollar global indulgence market. I love the phrasing there. Um, and that is a huge market, isn't it? 
Yeah, I mean, like, let's let's find the biggest number that we can possibly put into this. That's right. I would love to know all of the things that are in there. It's probably like a combination of like candy and ice cream and luxury goods and who knows, they might even throw like travel and <laughs> leisure in there too. Um but yeah, I mean there's there's definitely there is a there is a global market for donuts. I've I've never I've never been somewhere in my life where I haven't seen anybody haven't haven't seen anybody not eating a donut. So, you know, it's a it's a it's a global it's a yeah, it has global appeal as they say here. Beloved global brand with ubiquitous appeal. Yeah, ubiquitous. Yeah. We're going all in here on the phraseology. Yes. So we'll scroll through all of this kind of fluff here. I'm not all that interested in any of this because there are no numbers. Um, I swear they had years of financials here, but maybe I was looking at something else. However, I do have another tab up that has their financials. So we'll just pivot over to this. Um, so I'm just taking this off of a website, mm -hmm. stockanalysis.com. Gives you 2018, 2019, 2020 uh, financials for D-nut. Um, so you can see uh, revenue growth in 2020 was uh, actually about 17%. Jeez, that surprises me, Joe, right? I mean, I would have almost thought that it would be down with so many fast food stores. I think so too. I, th I think that's a, that's, a good, that's a good sign for them. Uh, yeah. And I, I imagine that they, that they will put up some pretty big numbers this year. So I'll be I'll be excited to see that first earnings report whenever it is, probably in August or September, I would think. Um, so yeah, they did lose quite a bit of money. It's this is a bit concerning to me because they lost 12 million in 2018, 34 million in 2019, so pre-pandemic, and then 2020 they lost 60 million. Not well, they're profitable on an great. operating basis. They are profitable on an operating basis, uh, and that did increase from 34 million to 38 million 2018 to 2019. As you might expect, that went down quite a lot in 2020, down to 4.28 million. So they have a so, they have so a nice gross the, margin just here. The, yeah, I mean, is it just the interest expense? Do they have a lot of a lot of debt? I guess they do. Two percent. Because that is that is a hefty interest expense of fifty-seven million in fiscal year twenty twenty. Yeah, if I'm reading that right. I mean go to the balance sheet up top there. If you click on balance sheet, let's see. Here we I... are. Long term and short term. Where are we here? Liabilities. Total debt 1.7 billion. So that's quite a lot. Up 10%. Yeah, considering their revenue. Yeah, that's how, that's concerning. Their, ca their cash is thirty-eight million. Um, and their debt is yeah. Their current debt alone is two hundred and twenty-four million. So yeah. current debt being debt that they have to pay off within the next twelve months. Yeah, that's that's definitely concerning. But <laughs> we've seen debt-riddled companies. I'm thinking of GameStop here that that the internet rallied behind so much so that they could eliminate all of their debt. So you never know. I definitely I, I could definitely see this becoming a meme stock of sorts. Um, you know, it's it's kind of silly. The symbol's a little silly. It's donuts. I think so I think there's definitely potential that Reddit could get behind this. Um, Todd, is there anything else you want to look for before we move over to LegalZoom? One of the questions that I have is, um, if you control F and search international, let's see if they give a breakdown of what their international is versus U.S. All right. Uh, let's see here. I'm guessing it's going to be towards the top, right? You're looking for like an, an itemized... Yeah, I just want to revenue. see how much of their revenue comes from international versus versus the U.S. Because to your point, I mean, they're oh, here we go. DFD Pro reaches forty seven hundred doors across the U.S. and Canada, twenty one hundred doors internationally. So definitely still very U.S. focused. Keep going yep. down, Joe, and let's see whether or not 
we can actually put a number on it. I'm sure it's in here somewhere, listeners, if you want yeah. to go back and look through the S1. And I always encourage everybody who's doing IPO, going to be investing in IPOs, read the S1. I mean, oh, God, yeah. <laughs> packed with information. It's like the, the, the 10K and how important it is just to Oh, here are the financials. I didn't scroll business. down far enough. Yeah. Okay. So product sales were 313 million in, um, in net revenue in the quarter ending April, 2021. So, okay. So that's just, yeah, that's because the, so yeah, in the first quarter, so their sales were up pretty nicely actually in the first quarter year yeah. over year. And did they, yeah, they still lost money though. And that interest expense was what? 8 million. Yeah. 8, 8 million. They lost money, but they lost a heck of a lot less they than lost. they did last year. So way less. I guess like, that's like a that's eleven point five million loss in the same quarter a year ago versus a three million loss in the most recent quarter. That just goes to show you, right? As people get back in, those sales start to come back in. Yeah, I think I saw their operating margin, Joe, was about four percent um, pre-COVID. Yeah, so not a hugely pot profitable company on an operating basis. Yeah, that's a pretty that's a pretty thin margin. So I've. Still More looking like for something. Margins. Still looking for something international. Um, oh, here's so here's some more. In the United Kingdom, twenty one of their stores remain closed. Oh, remain. I should say remained because this was as of January. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but still, they so they did have to close some stores. So, yeah, seventy five shops representing seven percent of total shops international. So That's they actually have significant. a lot of international shops. They do, it's which is good. Closed. Yeah. Definitely seems like the type of store that you could see in, in an airport somewhere, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so I don't know, Joe, like what is your, we, we obviously haven't dug in this. We're going to want to dig in deeper. And if you're listeners, if you're going to, you're going to buy this stock or you're it's in Krispy Kreme because you love the donuts, you're going to want to read this more thoroughly than the, obviously our, our you know, five minute overview looking right. at some of these things. But, you know, Joe, what do you, what is your gut telling you about Krispy Kreme? Um, I think I would, I, I think I would want to see, I say this a lot about, about IPOs when we talked about them in the past. Uh, Coinbase was a great example of this. I, I would want to see like their first earnings report as a, as a public company. Um, just because like the, the last year or so is just, it's not a really great indicator of what's, of how the company is actually doing. Cause there's been obviously the, the pandemic has just thrown a wrench in so many, so many things. So I know that's a bit of a cop out. I don't plan on investing in this out, out of the gate. Um, I'm really more interested to see who is investing in this. If it's, institutions or if it's the reddit institution <laughs> yeah i mean brands i do love consumer brands that are very well known and dunkin donuts did get taken out i think by private equity and starbucks has been a massive winner sure has so i guess the question would be and maybe our listeners can comment below um, and just let us know, like, if they've been in Krispy Kreme stores and if they're if they're innovating on food. I mean, that's been a big thing for Starbucks is being able to innovate with drinks and food and and get people to move beyond and ex you know explore some of these other things other than say, you know, the deliciously glazed donut. My God, right. those things are like those things are crack. Um, they're so good. <laughs> wow. Uh, so I mean, I do love consumer facing brands that are well known. So. Will I buy an IPO? 80% of stocks undercut their IPO price uh, within the first, I didn't want to say nine months or something like that. So I, if I'm not allocated, which I won't be because I'm not putting in for it, uh, then I'll probably just sit on my hands and watch trade and get established. But I am, like you, very curious yeah. to see who supports this. Is it, will it be institutionals or is it going to get, will the mean crowd adopt it? Yeah, so with that, Let's check out LegalZoom because I, so I'll admit, I did take a peek at this as I was Peter. preparing for the show just to make sure that, you know, everything checked out. Um, one thing I will note for those of you who are watching, the formatting on this form is garbage. So it's, yeah, as we get further down, it's, it gets kind of hieroglyphic. Um, we'll, we'll do our best. 
Uh, but this one I think is really interesting. So again, this is this is legal Zoom. This is going to be ticker LZ, uh, and they are scheduled to go public on the thirtieth, which is next Wednesday, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so again, you can see what I mean by the formatting. It's a bit hard to read, uh, but they. So this is again. This is yeah, just give like a quick the, overview, Joe. I mean, I'm a little bit familiar with Legal Zoom. Sure. So basically, what Legal Zoom is, they they say like their their mission statement is to I I believe they say to democratize law, and so it's a tool for especially small businesses and small business owners um, to essentially outsource almost crowdsource their basic legal work. So um, the the biggest thing that they do is they help with like uh, companies, company and corporations. So you're, you know, as you're, as you're starting a company, you have to incorporate as an LLC or an S corp or a C corp or whatever. And they have, they have lawyers kind of like how Fiverr has experts in all sorts of different niches. It's just that they have one niche, which is business law. Um, and so they have they have people that you can connect to. So again, this is, you know, we we've seen this kind of like democratization theme with many companies recently that have done really well. I mean, some that come to mind, Fiverr, of course, Airbnb, I think is is would fall into that category. Um, the other the other sites upwork um, you know, any, anything like that, that basically it's like kind of in an open marketplace where you could, if you had the, the correct credentials and the correct expertise, you could sign up and, and help people on this platform. So that's pretty much what this is. Um, yeah, and Joe, I just, you know, going to their website, it looks yeah. like you can do, you can make wills, you can do. Yeah. Can do so it's a, it's stuff. a little bit more than, yeah, it's a little bit more than just basic business stuff. Um, yeah. but and I believe like that the that the business side is their their primary driver the revenue. Butter. Yeah. Yeah, and it looks like, to your point, one of the things that jumped out at me on their website was that um, it's flat fee. So yeah. rather than, you know, worrying that someone's running up your billable hours, they come yep. up with a flat fee. So you can either do it yourself, it looks like, or you can um, use their platform to, to connect with a lawyer who will do this stuff for what it appears to be a flat fee. So anyways, that's, that's the, yeah. So we'll, yeah, let's dive in. So first we just have some highlights here. We're still kind of in the intro. So they did 471 million last year, 2020, 27% revenue year over year revenue growth from Q1 of this year. Um, I don't exactly know what this means. Subscription revenue mix. So, um, so there, there must be a subscription offering, Joe, that allows you to pay a certain amount of money to access uh, basic stuff or get discount or whatever. Yeah, maybe it's like a like an off. yeah, like an enterprise version for for someone for a, a a startup that has a lot of patent and trademark stuff that's kind of ongoing. Uh, so two percent net margin twenty twenty, nineteen percent adjusted EBITDA margin. So let's get through the fluff here. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm actually just going to scroll down and find their financial statements because I think that'll be more helpful and then we can kind of go from there. All right, so here we are. So this is, um, again, this is really hard to read, <laughs> but I believe what we're looking at is the year ended, on the left, we have the year ended December 31st, 2020, and then we have uh, the most recent quarter ending at the end of March, 2021. Um, so it's a little it looks bit like, hard looks like to they figure need some out. formatting help on this one. <laughs> yeah, seriously, they need, to, they, they need to hire someone on Fiverr, I think, to clean up this <laughs> garbage formatting. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, so we can see that they did a uh, hundred and so this this 2020 heading is out of line. But basically, in Q1 2020, they did 105 million. Q1 of this year it was 134 million. So some pretty nice growth there. Um, gross profit went up from 70 million to 90 million. Um, again, pretty good. Uh, their interest expense is certainly uh, more in line uh, with with what I'm comfortable seeing. I don't know about you, Todd. 
Um, and then, yeah, where are we with net income? So, oh, this is interesting. So they made money in 2019 and 2020, but then in Q1 of 2020 and Q1 of 2021, they lost money. Yeah, we might want to control F seasonality. A lot of times, listeners, if you're looking at a 10K and you're trying to see whether or not, uh, why, why, explain why one quarter is good or one quarter isn't good, sometimes so many companies will have, will say right in their disclosures, right in that five, in the 10K, they'll say, okay, yeah, our first quarter is weaker than our fourth quarter or whatever. I mean, think like, um, Think like retail. Retail is going to have obviously very big seasonality that's going to be back end loaded toward the end of the year where the holidays are. Yep. All right. So here's a little section on seasonality. Um, we have experienced and expect that we will continue to experience. Oh my God. Add some more words, legal zoom. Jeez. Uh, we <laughs> seasonality in the number of orders placed when we enter into subscription agreements with customers higher number of orders and enter into more subscriptions in the first quarter of the year. But that doesn't make any sense. Then why would they be losing money in the first quarter, but making money for the rest of the year? Well, they Further may not be able to report it all in the first quarter for the subscription. Maybe. Yeah. Further seasonality is reflected in the timing of our revenue rec recognition in the second quarter. Okay. When we yeah, typically experience a high amount of revenue from orders placed in the first quarter, but fulfilled in the second quarter. Okay. That's surprising to me though. I would think that they would have high seasonality in the first quarter because tax season and then the fourth quarter because end of the fiscal year. But I guess not yeah, they say winter really. Winter holidays, Christmas, Thanksgiving. Yeah, not a lot of people thinking. I, I, you know, I'm doing it. And then New Year, New Year begins, and people start getting excited and thinking about you know getting their ducks in order, and then recording that Q1 revenue orders rather as revenue in Q2, and then yep. weakness in Q3. Okay, so, yeah, so theoretically, just... Q2 looks like their best quarter of the year which is the first quarter that they will report as a public company. Yeah. So it will be interesting to see. I'm just scrolling through to see if they have any more like meaningful mention of seasonality. One uh, of the other tips that I, and tricks listeners that you can do when you're looking at these data, and I like to do it, we, don't, we're, we probably won't do it today because of time, um, but you can also go through, and I like to track the change as a percentage of revenue of the operating expenses. So for example, the thinking would be, okay, well, if there's leverage in the business as sales grow, then sales general and administrative expenses, SG&A, should decline as a percentage of revenue as the company gets bigger. Yep. So I like to kind of track that trend. So that's something else that you can do, listeners, with some of these companies as you're trying to figure out um, how well they're executing and where they are in, in the maturing level. Obviously, yeah. you know, young technology companies plowing money into headcount, um, you don't want to necessarily penalize them. But as for a company like this, where it's a little bit more mature, people are familiar with it, it's been around a while, um, I would be curious to look at that at some point. So, yeah, I'm going to um, do us a favor here and I'm going to pivot over to this tab, which is the same site I was on for Krispy Kreme, just because it's actually legible. Oh, wow. It's actually <laughs> so, usable. I know. Isn't that wonderful? And we can like, you know, click on different links and it brings us different places. Isn't that wonderful? So, so yeah, this is, this is easier to read. So we see 2019 to 2020, they had 15.2% revenue growth. So 471 million up from 408 million the previous year. Um, the cost of revenue did not go up as much, uh, 155 compared to 137. So their gross profit went from 271 million in 2019 to 316 million in 2020. Pretty good, I'd say. Um, so then the all important net income, 9.9 .9 million in 2020 up from 7.4 million in 2019. So they have a nice gross margin of 67%, operating margin of a little over 10%. Slightly concerning that that's down from 11.3 in 2019. But again, 
as Todd kind of mentioned, like they're probably just really trying to increase headcount, and those are just some some growing pains that that we that we can see with rapidly growing companies like this. So it could also be one time legal fees, right? Ready for their IPO. There's a lot of different things that can to maybe are impacting that. Yeah. But so I would definitely not want to a, watch that chain. Trade. Not a so huge, to... not a huge decline here, but. And it's not something to panic about, but yeah, as as Todd said, something to something to watch. So, what do you what do you think? What do you think about this, Todd? Do you does this look better than Krispy Kreme? Well, the funny thing is that you know, looking at the S one and now the you know, format, like all the legalese in there, it's like okay, so some of the legal Zoom attorneys built this thing. It's a little too a little too much. Uh, they need to modernize that a little bit. Um, I think that this is very valuable. It could it could actually be a, a big trend to exploit as we go increasingly towards contractors and gig oriented work and away from the traditional. We're going to sit in a cubicle at a big organization in a big high rise in a downtown city. A lot of people are going to have to form their own LLCs to protect themselves. And, you know, they probably aren't going to use, some will obviously use local lawyers, but, you know, a lot of people will probably turn to the interwebs to try yep. and figure out, you know, a solution. So I think that there is, there is some pretty good tailwinds for this. Um, I do like that they're profitable um, and that their revenue is growing. Uh, and I think that financially, from financial metric standpoint, I, it looks better to me than Krispy Kreme. The the one thing that I, geez, you know, I, I just, I probably, I'm not going to invest in either of them right now. I'm going to watch how both of them go. Um, I feel like this company could be very business cycle oriented. So I I'm going to do a little bit more research into how that well you know, what, what did it, what, what, how well did it do during, during different periods or how might it do in different periods where, you know, the economy falls into recession? Yeah. It's, it's kind of interesting, right? Because we're, we're not used to, uh, we're not used to tracking public companies in the legal industry because obviously those are usually partnerships, private partnerships. So, it's it's kind of a it's it's kind of a new a new horizon, um, and so just just out of curiosity, Todd, do you know like what sector will this fall into in our in our research eventually? That's a good point. I mean, sometimes these service providers end up in very weird places. It may end up in services. It could also end up in financials. Yeah. So we'll have to wait and see. And just as a reminder, listeners, IPOs won't get scores in our research and our scoring model for a number of months. So we won't be able to add these right away to the research to give you a score that's usable because a lot of our score is based on historical data. And frankly, until they're publicly traded, we don't have any historical data that we can put in there. <laughs> Absolutely right. Yeah. In so just just to wrap it up. Um, yeah, I agree, Todd. LegalZoom is definitely it's a better a better looking company on paper. Um, I'm actually I'm interested in I'm going to be watching it closely. I'm going to have it on a on a close watch list because I I think that I think that they they have the the potential to keep growing and they could potentially use this IPO as a way to accelerate their growth. So I think both are worth watching. Don't get me wrong, I'll have both on a watch list, but I think Krispy Kreme is probably going to end up on my kind of Wall Street bets meme stock-ish watch list. Um, this, the same watch list that uh, that Virgin Galactic is on. Uh, you know, highly volatile, kind of somewhat unpredictable price movement. 